Good evening, and welcome to the Social Justice and Education Award Lecture featuring Dr. Sharon Fries Britt. Introducing our lecturer is Michelle Knight Manuel, who is currently a professor at Teachers College at Columbia University. She is also the executive editor of Teachers College Record. Dr. Knight Manuel is the incoming dean of the Morgridge College of Education at the University of Denver. Dean Michelle Knight Manuel served as the chair of the Social Justice Committee from 2019 to 2021. She is delighted and honored to introduce the recipient of the 2021 Social Justice Award. Dean Knight Manuel. I appreciate the generosity and graciousness of Jamel. And um, I just want to say good evening to everyone. And thank you for coming to honor and celebrate with us tonight. You know, this is a great moment for AERA, and it's a great moment for all of us. And when we think about the Social Justice Award, it's for individuals who have advanced social justice through education research. Dr. Sharon Fries Britt is Professor of Higher Education, Student Affairs, and International Education Policy at the University of Maryland, College Park, Maryland. Her pioneering work on high achieving black students has influenced the leadership and practice of social justice across many campuses in the United States. She has also been lauded by her colleagues for her courage and resilience in her ability to influence leaders in systemic systems of power and privilege. Additionally, one of her colleagues has noted that Dr. Fries Britt is highly regarded by her colleagues and students and is an outstanding example of what it means to honor your values walk in your purpose, and work with integrity in the academy. Her colleague goes on to note that she is the blueprint of an engaged, socially just scholar for many of us. Her decades of work on black students in STEM, in STEM learning environments, is an exemplar of the power of research to both inform and transform. We're thankful for our colleagues who are willing to share the good news about one another. And so that is just an uh, intellectual generosity that I appreciate from one of your colleagues. Dr. Sharon fries Britt has been recognized as one of the leading voices on equity and inclusion. Her scholarship brilliantly engages multiple constituencies from government agencies to foundations and to national organizations in advancing social justice by addressing some of higher education's most challenging problems, building capacity for diversity, equity, and inclusion, increasing success for faculty and students of color, and improving campus racial climate. I am excited for our lecture tonight. I really believe it's gonna feed not only our minds, but our spirits and our bodies. I would like for you to join me in welcoming Dr. Sharon Friesritt as the recipient of the 2021 Social Justice Award. Good evening, everybody. This is the Friday night serious folks. <laughs> we are in good shape. Let me tell you, when you show up on a Friday night, you mean business. So I love working and seeing people who mean business. Let me just say, Dr. Knight, um, Dr. Knight Manuel, thank you for just the, that introduction and for blending in the personal piece, but also just the scholarship and the thoughtfulness. Um, it has been a pleasure to work with both of my colleagues here in this process. It's been humbling. And I want to just start by just saying, I was whispering to them, and I turned the mic off. I said, to receive this award from AERA is really daunting. I would have, if you had told me, oh, you're going to one day guess it, please, be for real. So it is really a career highlight for me, and I want to start there to say that I am deeply honored that 
as under your leadership with the committee, you all saw um, value in the work that I was doing. So I deeply appreciate it and want to thank ARA. And in fact, I'm going to ask you all, I'm going to get you to indulge me long enough because I think it's important, you don't get here by yourself. There are a lot of people. So I have these communities of people that I always have to thank. So allow me some space to do that and then I'll get to the lecture tonight. And so the, the group that I have to go to next is my UMD family. And I, I see a lot of you in the audience. I've been at the University of Maryland for 37 years. And I do not count the years that I paid them for my education. I count, I count the years they started paying me. And that's a very nice thing. And it's been for 37 years. That's a beautiful thing. But I'm raising that because University of Maryland has been a great home for me to test out both my, um, my administrative side of my life, because I was on the administrative side before I went into the professoriate, and then the faculty side. And that's unusual still today. And so I, and especially was unusual when I did it a number of years ago. And so I deeply value that it's been a place that has allowed me to expand my own development. But I need to say a couple of names. I'm gonna call out some folks. Dr. Kimberly Griffin was one of the colleagues who I discovered after I learned I won this award. I was like, who did this? Um, pulled together just a dream team. And I saw my um, former colleague who left me in Maryland but went on and did great things. Dr. Laura Perner was on that team. Roger Worthington, Jeff Milan, Adriana Kizar, Laurel Espinosa, you all uh, told a lot of stories, but thank you for telling the stories to get me to this position. I also want to acknowledge that um, my former dean, uh, Jennifer King Rice, who's now the provost of the University of Maryland, and my chair, Will Liu, and leadership matters. Leadership really matters at a university. They have been so supportive of the kind of work that I've been doing, the impact of my work, and I just want to shout them out because I think that is critical. Also, just lots of colleagues and former students I've worked with. Um, many of them are here in the room. Dr. Burt was the first to show up. Raise your hand, Dr. Burt, because he gets prizes for like showing up. But truly just having colleagues, Kelly, you know, Dr. just coming and doing your postdoc with us and now out being a professor is just means so much work um, to me to see you in the audience and just many folks who are just very supportive. Alberto Cabrera, a colleague who has recently retired. Um, many, many folks, just bear with me, I need to do a couple others. When I made the transition from administration to the academic side, I was attending the Association for the Study of Higher Education. These folks are not in the room, but they are critical to having helped me to find a space at ASH. And so I'm gonna call them out. Christopher, M. Christopher Brown, some of y'all know M. Christopher Brown. He made ASH a, a space for me in the early years. That was a space where I felt like I could find myself. James Davis, an incredible person who is welcoming and open. Um, Lily Garcia, who gave me an opportunity to do one of my first book chapters. Uh, Mary Howard Hamilton, who just a solid sister scholar who just really opened up the space. Sean Harper, who was coming out of his grad program actually, but interested in doing high achieving work and we connected right away. I can name so many others, but I see Dr. Lori Patton Davis in the house, who over the years has been a scholar who's inspired so many of us. So, so good to see you. I've had mentors, uh, and I'm getting to the last couple people on my list. I've had mentors who, for if it were not for them, I would not be standing here, so I have got to honor them. Um, Dr. Richard Tate, who most people probably don't know anymore in these environments, but he was studying alternative pathways to the professoriate. He is exactly why I am a professor, because I was, in fact, an alternative pathway. I had dinner with him a couple weeks ago, and he had a chance to finally meet my daughter um, after a number of years. He saw her the last time when she was a child. Freeman Rabowski is a dear mentor friend of mine, and you'll hear a little bit more about him later, so I won't say much here, Marie Davison and Britt Kerwin, senior level administrators at the university. My last two closing circles is I, I could not do it without my family and community, and my life partner and husband, Dr. Ned Britt Jr., isn't here today, but our daughter traveled with me um, today, and so Couture, as you know, I always say, you are, have taken it far, much further than any of us ever have in the family, and I look forward to, and I'm so glad I have an opportunity to see what you are doing already with your life, so thank you for supporting your mom the way you do. Um, and then I have to, as I move to my talk, just say that I've been held in the academy by divine grace. I really have been. I, I'm not here tonight to tell that full story, but you ought to know that I don't take lightly that I've had an opportunity to be in the academy engaged with people. Um, many colleagues who are in this room um, who I've worked with over the years, and most especially the relationships and the interactions I've had with my uh, students. So as I stand here, there are four circles of influence that really shape what I want to say to you tonight. And those circles are, I, I, 
I'll only talk about one in a little bit more detail, but I've had an administrative career that shapes how I think about social justice issues and my work in general. I clearly have in, in the midst and have had a faculty career, but I've been a consultant on race equity diversity issues in federal agencies, higher education, private industry for the longest period, 40 plus years of my career. And that has offered for me ways of understanding cultural contexts that are different than the academy, but inform some of my work in the academy and vice versa. But the circle that I want to spend a little bit more time on is who I am as a black woman navigating the academy. Now, one of the things that makes sense if I talk about being both black and um, identified as cisgendered woman, it would not surprise you for me to talk about the navigation of race and racism and sexism. That is expected. That is something that uh, we would anticipate. And that has been the case. But I want to offer two additional layers to myself to help you understand how I do my work. And actually, these, these additional layers have really continued to show up for me as I've matured. That's a nice way of saying I'm older than 60. Um, and so they've been going on in my 50s. And it's been a beautiful thing to watch it. So let me just share what these two are to layer that on to being a black woman, because it's allowed me to understand how I'm showing up is not just in the intersection of those two things, but it's actually supplemented by these other two things. And they are these. So I went to high school the year after Title IX was passed. I know that that's Dayton. And so that was in 1973. I went to high school in 1973. And Title IX had just been passed for women. And what that meant is that sports became a really big opportunity structure for women. Well, I was actually a um, triple varsity sports person. I played team sports. So I ran, I played basketball. That was my, I was a high school American for basketball. I played, um, I ran track and I played power volleyball. And the reason why I'm sharing that with you is what I've learned about myself is I learned how to be in competitive modes, but also understanding the risk of that. You take risks, that you have to speak up. You have to think about the team that you're working with. And so what grew for me as a part of my personality is caring for what's happening with everyone on the team and recognizing that everybody brings something to the game, that none of us are doing this solo and that you could be the super athlete on something, but you cannot win it all by yourself. And that spirit of team, that spirit of knowing that we have to look at what people are bringing to a process has stayed with me. Let me tell you what the other one is. And the other layer that is far less evident, um, not that athlete is evident, although I try real hard to keep that part of my life active. The other theme is that I am, re I am a product of a military family. So my father served in the military for well over 30 some odd years. And you know, if you know anything about the services, and this is the army, but it can be, I've had members in my family who are also in other branches of the service. And so the military is a particular cultural context. It's a very diverse context. It's a context in which you, tra we traveled a lot when I was younger. I have a complete different appreciation for meeting people all over the world comfortably. But it's a context in which you are sort of, um, raised to understand that there's a distinctness about this community, a way in which we, again, embrace the fullness of who we are as a community, right? And so it was not unusual for me to have a wide range of diverse friends. And so one of my friends happened to be a white female friend. She had invited me one day to come swimming with her family. Well, that was one thing I loved to do. We'd go to the pool on base. We lived off base, but we'd go to the pool on base. So I joined her, my mom dropped me off over her house and we had gone, I was excited about it, and we went to the swimming pool that day. And, what, and, and I'm sharing this story with you because one of the things I've learned about my work in social justice is one of my first entrees to understanding inequity actually came as a result of being in the military, as a part of a military kid. And so when I went to this pool with my friend that day, one of the things that stood out for me right away is that the pool was huge. It was this fancy large pool. It was predominantly white folks at the pool. They had a couple of sliding options. They had a nice little curved sliding board. They had a medium sliding board and then a high dive. They actually had a concession stand with some real food. And I may not have realized that her father might have paid for it in advance, but it felt like we could just go eat when we wanted to eat. Like, you know, you swim, you get hungry. So when I saw this pool, I was sort of like, Where? this is not the pool that I grew up going to or going to on base. In fact, the pool that I went to was not only smaller, we had one little sliding board. There was definitely no concession stand. It was actually a vending machine. And we packed our lunch. We packed our lunch because we shared the food. What I also understood about our pool 
is that it always was in need of repair. So I'm sharing this with you because my friend's father was a colonel. My father was an enlisted man, master sergeant, brilliant career, and went all the way through his career. But I remember when I came back from that pool day, it stood out for me, like I wanted to start going to that pool. So I asked my dad questions about the pool. I was like telling him, and I don't remember what his answer was, but I remembered his energy. And you'd have to know my dad, he's a military no-nonsense man, he shut it down. Like you don't ask a lot of questions, you won't be going to that pool, you'll be taking yourself right back over to the pool. Our pool was predominantly brown and black families, biracial families, mixed families, it was always crowded, the pool was not big enough to handle everybody. We did have better music and better activities afterwards. Like we get out of the pool to dance and go back in. So, was it, so it wasn't a bad pool, but that experience showed me, began to open my eyes into, and I didn't have vocabulary of inequities or it was different, and in fact, I, when I think back at that time, what it might have been like for my father to see this young person in his life, his child, ask a bunch of questions around class issues, undergirding class, rankism, hierarchy, status. Like my dad didn't have the wherewithal to talk that through. So he literally basically said, you're not going to the pool unless you get invited again. But it opened up the space for me to start asking about these differences in access to opportunities. These differences systemically, because we have been told we were all in the military community. We shared a cultural context. We were all families that went to serve the United States. And so, of course, college made a difference for my, um, my dad was not, I'm first generation in my family college educated. And so he didn't have the same kind of access to opportunity as a non-commissioned officer. And it would take years for me to understand that. So as I think about my work and the arena of education, I have taken the same sort of questioning of what resources, what opportunities, what do we see in our environments and how do we all play a role in those environments. The central focus of my research, as you already heard in the introduction, is around the experiences really of African Americans, both fac faculty, staff, and students, but I'm gonna focus tonight pretty much on students. My work was grown, my, work in, my initial work came out of research and work I did with the Meyerhoff Scholars at UMBC. And I share that with you, not so much because it was on high achieving black students, but because at that time in 1989, I was, I was asking my advisor, I said, you know, much of this research is from a deficit perspective on black students in the scholarship. I want to see, I want to do some research in my dissertation that looks at the other end. It's not that I didn't think that was an important piece, but it wasn't describing the full expression of academic talent. And he said to me, then you need to meet Freeman Rabowski. This didn't know, and Dr. Rabowski at the time was not the president. He was building that program. The reason why that became important is it gave me an example of a program in practice that was building what I was interested in studying. And it was inspiring in the early parts of my career. The other piece that I want to share before I get to the content of what I want to share with you about that work is that at that time, about a few years later, actually it was a number of years later because I was publishing off of some of my dissertation work and publishing off of some work I was doing on honor students. I had received a letter at the university, and I don't know about you, sometimes you get, you're in your office, you're going through the mail, and I received this letter from the National Society of Black Physicists saying, we'd like for you to present your work on high achieving black students. I said, I'm not no physicist, and I literally did just like this. Took it and just ripped it up and threw it in the can. Now, you're gonna say that's irresponsible, but I thought, I'm not a physicist. They got the wrong person, wrong study. Fast forward 30, about 30 days later, I get this email saying, we invited you to do a presentation at the National, I said, oh, this is a real thing. So I called him. And his name is Dr. Lawrence Norris. And I said, I said, yeah, I got your letter. I said, but I'm not a physicist. He said, we know you're not a physicist, but you're writing about high achieving black students. This was pivotal for my career academically because it was an organization outside of my field that read my work that said, we would like for you to join in a relationship with us and study our high achieving students in physics. And that turned into a 10 year, and I'm sharing it with you because it was foundational to the nature of this work of centering black students, which is where I want to take my talk tonight. As I share with you, I wanna share with you and draw from not just my research, although that's critical, and yes, everything I'm sharing with you tonight is anchored in my research, but I consider my research to be actually uh, undergirded by not just the studies that I've done with my team and students, but also my practice in the field, my experiences in the field, 
um, as someone who's navigating the academy herself, but also working with folks in the field, trying to understand how to engage in these issues. So I want to bring that into the conversation. So the title of my talk is Centering Black Academic Lives, Cultivating the Full Expression of Self in the Academy. So I want to share with you three overarching themes. And let me just get a sip of this water. So what I want to do is I have three overarching themes that I want to sort of put out there to open the space when we go to Q&A. And each of these themes ought to feel real familiar to you. You will have heard them, some aspect of them. And the reason why they will feel familiar is because they really reflect what Albert Einstein said about science. And it's one of my favorite quotes. What Einstein said is that the whole of science is the refinement of everyday ideas. Think about that. The whole of science is the refinement of everyday ideas. I personally can't think of anything that's more everyday and what needs to be refined than the work we're doing to support black students in the academy. And so the themes I'm going to share with you, because the research, not just mine, but lots of other scholars, is an enduring set of narratives of the challenges that we're still experiencing. And yes, there's been progress, for sure. But these themes are staying with us and continue to stay with us. And let me offer for you, as I center black students in my work, and, and what I would say to you is that many of the things that we're going to talk about, the points under these three themes, um, really apply to all of us and all of our students, but they particularly apply to black students. And I want to provide a compelling piece of data. And I thought long and hard, you know, when you're doing these kind of talks, you think, oh, we're at AERA, people are going to want, like, where's the data coming from? There's a lot of data out there, and so I'm going to give you what I think summarizes it beautifully, and it became a motivating piece for me in 2019. And as many of you probably already know and have looked at, um, ACE published the, in 2019 his race ethnicity report. We hadn't had one in about a decade. And, there, and we had a convening. Anyone in the room go to the convening in DC? OK, you were there, Kelly. OK, anybody else? Well, it was a beautiful convening. It was a wonderful convening. It was intellectually stimulating. There were a lot of people in the room, big time scholars from the field who were um, in the room. And it was a robust conversation. And a ACE was reporting out all of its findings across the groups. We were all super excited. The press was there. It was fabulous, right? And so as these panels were going on through the day, and they were reporting out the key elements of the report, we we gotten to a point where a a quote was shared. And I'm going to share the quote with you, because I've actually shared this quote since 2019. It, it re-anchors me. If ever I thought black students didn't need to be recentered again, which I don't believe, this has said to me, we need to all understand why centering of black students to bring their full self to the academy matters. Here's what the quote was. Too many black students fare poorly in America's post-secondary education system at both the undergraduate and the graduate levels. Advances in black students' enrollment and attainments have been accompanied by some of the lowest persistence rates, highest undergraduate dropout rates, highest borrowing rates, and largest debt burdens of any group. Now, you may need more data, and I encourage you to go. There's a lot out there. But I'm not going to spend my time trying to convince you that we have a problem. We have a significant problem, and this was, this was pre-COVID. And what we know post-COVID is that it has only gotten worse. And by the way, I have to share this. I was emotionally unstable in that meeting at one point because I've committed my life to trying to undergird and, and uplift and amplify the experiences of a group of students, high-achieving black students, who, for all intents and purposes, ought to be just breezing through the academy. They're, they are highly capable. But what they're running into is a whole host of factors that make it very difficult for them to succeed. Not all, and this is not everyone, absolutely. But when I heard that summary comment, it hit my heart in the most devastating way. Because the, to, to make up the ground for that is going to cost us a whole generation of time. Um, because we move too slow in the academy to make that up quickly. So as I go to my themes, I'm going to go to the first theme. I want to say to you that, um, again, these are themes that you, that are part of the everyday refinement process, but we have to do more than just refine. We have to literally systematically change, and I'm going to talk about that under theme, the second theme. So let me do the first theme. So the first theme is 
that we have to recognize and be intentional about how we support, mentor, and socialize black students in the academy. So the main, how do we support them? How do we mentor and socialize black students in the academy? Basically, it's we have to invest in them. You can shortchange it and say we have to make a real serious decision to be invested in the success of black students and make that. Whenever we decide, we all know what it feels like when someone invests in us or invests in a situation, we have to decide to do that. So I'm gonna offer a couple of key points. This comes straight out of the research that we've done both with the NSBP project for 10 years, also the American Institute of Physics last project that I worked on with my colleague, Dr. Cabrera, and a whole team at University of Maryland doing a national survey, working with them on how to uplift the experiences of African American in physics. Um, so this is where most of these themes, but they also cut across some other studies that I've done. So the first point I wanna make under this theme is that what we hear consistently from students is they want to be valued holistically. They want to, us to understand that in order to really support them and to mentor them and to be in community with them, that they're coming in as individuals with a wholeness of self. And that if we only are trying to approach it only on the academic side, like they need the academic support, the academic information, the academic um, kinds of ways in which they strengthen themselves, but that a lot of what they're also navigating requires us to understand that it is an important part of their life. You're gonna hear me say more about that. And so it's important that we take a holistic approach in how we're advising our students. We're not gonna do it all in the first advising session or the first meeting, but over time, how do we think about not only how I'm guiding this student and working with them academically, but who are they? And what is it that they are wanting for their sense of self over time? So that's an important piece that we have learned and heard from students regularly about wanting to be engaged with people where they know who they are, when there's trust factors there, not just to come in and tell someone about their, their life. The second point that I wanna say under this particular theme is that we have to be intentional about um, building students or working with students in a co-constructive way and collaborative way, their sense of belonging to the academy. They do not feel they belong. Because, and I have to tell you, I understand that because it's hard for black and brown folks to still feel we belong in the academy, even when you get to certain phases and stages in your life and career. And so at the early stages, even high achieving brilliant students that I have talked to who are multi-talented, by the way, at all kinds of different institutions, they are not, and one of the ways in which I collect my data at NSBP was at their national conferences, is because I, we would see our team would have access to students from all different kinds of institutional types. But their sense of belonging matters significantly, but it's not happening. And let me say a couple of critical things about this. Um, part of the connection for sense of belonging, we already know from research, not, obviously not just my own, but lots of other scholars, is the connection to faculty and peers. And the sense of belonging for faculty, I heard specific details from students over the years about um, what they saw faculty doing for other students, but it wasn't happening for them. And it really boils down to the extent to which faculty are affirming and, and acknowledging students' presence and their work and their, um, their, the, collaborating with them, engaging with them. And so sense of belonging has to be built up in our academic units both on and off inside the uh, academy and academic units as well as in extracurricular kind of work. The third one, the third point I wanna share here really is born out of having worked with a lot of STEM students. And it's this science identity piece. So let me just say something about this. So what I hear consistently from black students who are deeply committed to science and wanna be scientists is that they struggle with the fact that faculty oftentimes don't know what to do with their other forms of salient identity that is important to their navigation in the academy. So that can be race, that can be gender, that can be sexuality, that can be religion. Actually in our AIP project, um, we've had several students who said, wow, it was great to see in this national conference other folks who are non-Christian present, like seeing someone in, who's from different faith practice as a black person felt very different. I felt like I could have a conversation and I'm a scientist and I can be here. And so, the challenge of how do we mentor and how do we support and socialize students is in the STEM fields, oftentimes when students bring these, when black students bring these issues up, what they get is, well, just you're a scientist, just focus on the science. You don't need to focus on the racial unrest. You don't need to focus on this, just focus on the science. 
And what that does for black students' sense of well-being is say, you're not understanding what is impacting my ability to even do, yes, I'm interested in the science and I care about the science deeply, but this is a piece of what I am trying to grapple with as I find myself in the academy. And so it's important for us to connect and allow in the academy these identities to understand that they are in relationship with each other for students in ways that are very powerful. And, not, and when I'm talking with faculty in the STEM, in the STEM fields, um, the fear of thinking that they're not serious scientists because they're putting some energy in other parts of their life is an unnecessary fear. Because when students are deeply committed to science, and they are, and they want to be, they're looking for ways of blending and bringing that in. And that can happen when we open up the space for them to talk about why that's important. The fourth, and I have two more, the fourth and fifth one under this theme, is black students express a whole lot of pro-social behavior. They are deeply committed to giving back. They are doing the work and want to do the kind of work in STEM and other areas so that they can give back because it was given to them. That's another theme that is in the academy oftentimes not fully supported. Like what does it mean to give back? You ought to be studying this in STEM. You ought to be, and so finding the space to really support them and mentor them means that you, and, and I'm gonna be very specific here. Because sometimes the examples come up this way. Students will say, they'll, I don't understand the nature of the research. I'm not a physicist, but they'll give me some long name of some long project that they wanna do. And I know it's very important. I don't know it, the nature of it, but they'll talk about it. And they'll say, this is connected to um, black folks doing da da or Latinx community, because I've had more than black students in my studies. And they'll say, but when I bring that up to my faculty advisor, they say, you're in the wrong program. We don't do that here. And I'll say, but, I'm, but it's connected to what you're doing. It's just going in this direction. When I talk to faculty about it and have this conversation, they'll, they have this conversation with them, they'll often say, yeah, we have students that way, and I think we may have made a mistake. It's not the right program. Here's what the students are actually asking for. They're not asking to go study it today and now. They're expressing an interest and a connection to the science that all we need to do to support it is to say, wow, we haven't done that here. We don't do that kind of work. But it's interesting that you are bringing that up. Let's map out over the next couple of years how we might create opportunities to explore this. Literally, it's allowing the intellectual dialogue to exist as a potential. And lo and behold, when you do that, guess what? You find opportunities where you might actually be able to link students. And so there, all of these efforts require us to think differently about them not being counter to the academy, but actually complementary to opening the space of their academic learning. And then very quickly for this, for this theme, the last one, is that we have to really affirm the thinking process that our students bring to the academy, how they think. And, and there's some specific work that we've done in, in finding that, and this came out of the AIP project, when we are, when faculty are actually saying to students, the way you just talked about that is what a scientist does. Line it up for them. Like when you hear them talking or when you say, you know, you just presented that in a way that's unique and new. We struggled with that. Now this is a professor talking to a student. We struggled with that a couple years ago, but you just display that in a way that's brilliant. Like sometimes, and I've seen this as a faculty member, we see, and I've done it myself with students and say, wow, you all did that better than we do. Because sometimes we see it, but don't say it. Like we'll see it and say, we know it's all good, but we're just not gonna tell you how good it is. Well, who does that serve? Who does that serve except for our own insecurities? So why not say, you just did that better than we did it, and learn from it. It's a collab, because literally when we see our students, we're seeing our, our future colleagues. You know, we're building those relationships there. So that's what I would offer under that first um, theme. That's why I only have three themes, because here's the good news. The second theme has a list, but the third doesn't. So, um, and I'm watching my time. I still have a little bit more time. So here's my second theme. And I'm shifting from the students to the system. And some of this comes out in what I, what I said about that 2019 summary. So the second theme is this, progress must be made and marked by real change and transformation in campus policies, practices, and a sense of community. I wanna shift from the investment to, of the student because I don't care how much investment and how much undergirding we give of students, if our systems are struggling with so much inequity and with so many challenges, we are still trying to meet the needs of students in inadequate ways 
because we're in systems that have a lot of deficiencies and we're pointing to students as if the deficiencies only rest with them. So here's this list. It's, and this will go a little bit quick, more quickly because the first one is the financial burden. This is a real issue for black students. Um, we are losing them because of the financial burdens in higher education. And so we have got to figure out systemically how to either fundraise to get more money but think more strategically or look at debt burden issues. That has to be one of the systemic ways that we deal with issues for this population in particular. Um, and so I'm not going to elaborate on that one like I did on the other themes, but that's a very real issue of systemic kinds of barriers to the success of black students. And increasingly, in the last couple years when we were doing the AIP project, the level of um, number of students who were planned behavior was, I'm going to have to take a break and drop out because this is costing too much and I don't want the burden of that cost to be placed on my family, was very real. Now, they had every intention of trying to come back, but they were planning to drop out. And so we have got to figure out systemically how to handle this issue because we know that disproportionately black families, black community, and the ways in which wealth distribution in this country has over decades and centuries evolved leave our communities in less of a position to be able to do the traditional pathway to paying for college, mortgaging your house, doing different things. Second one is our hostile campus climates. They are very real, they're pernicious, and they have not slowed down. They have not slowed down. We want to think they've slowed down. All of us want the best for our campuses. But there's a lot of anti-blackness that's happening in these spaces, and you don't have to be a white person to be anti-black. A lot of people are being anti-black, OK? There's a lot that students are dealing with in the classroom and in spaces outside of the classroom. And so our campus climates have to be dealt with in very real ways, not in a pedestrian way of doing a workshop and checking a box, but holding people accountable and changing the culture of that. And that work begins with a lot of us who are in these positions as faculty and administrators doing our work. We have to do our work as well so that we are able to model and to tease out and to speak up and to be able to um, do it in ways that create the learning space. It doesn't have to be a space of hostility, but it has to be a space that opens up the reality. When our students see and observe and are existing in spaces that are uh, where the climate of our campus or in our departments, which is where we hear from our students in the study, you can feel it in the department and the program. And if we as faculty and staff are not addressing that or beginning a plan to address that, they can see that. They see that from us, and so why would they be investing? That's a systemic issue that we have to deal with in holding each other and our systems uh, accountable for that. The third one is kind of related, but in a different kind of way, uh, and that has to do with the academic, um, a lot of the academic spaces are not spaces, as I've said, where students go. They go to counter spaces on campus, so they're not in the spaces. They don't feel that sense of the academic unit is where they can be, and so, how we see those counter spaces and how we undergird those counter spaces becomes very important that as in, in oftentimes in STEM fields, the counter spaces of student organizations, church organizations, community organizations are seen as wasted opportunity and wasted spaces for students. And we have to stop calling that wasted because that's actually what's allowing them to survive your space because they have that counter space. And rather, we have to begin to say, what do we need to do to not only keep them still having that as an access point, but what do we do in, again, the culture? That's why I say it's connected to our campus climate. What do we do to create authentic spaces where student can, students can feel like they can be in their departments and feel whole? And I know it can take a lot of time, and it means that we have to have more faculty of color. It means we need to have more staff of color. We need to have more students, because both in the peer and in the academic side, they need to see more folks like them. I'm going to quickly go back to resources. Um, only a couple more themes here, or points under this one. Resource. Um, beyond just paying for college, there's another level that we kept hearing in our research that was really pretty interesting around how black students were witnessing how resources at the departmental level and the program level seemed to not get to them, um, except unless they found out about it. So everything from travel to support to going to the conferences to um, additional emergency kinds of funds, um, even resources not just related to funds but related to people's time. So we often would hear, I don't get the same amount of time doing advising hours. I get, I get sort of told, okay, your time is up, we gotta move on. 
Whereas I, students will say, when I'm meeting with my other peers who are non-black, I hear, oh no, they went over the whole program, they stayed longer, they actually signed, they actually told me I could come. So how we look at and understand the sharing of information, the sharing of resources, the sharing of time becomes an important part of equity in a system. And one last example I want to give is that oftentimes in STEM fields, students will find out that from their peers that someone got an extra, um, extra time to turn something in. And what I often say to faculty is, if you already have a couple of students coming to you for, for extra time, you need to go to the class and say, it seems like everybody needs extra time. Because some students don't know you can ask for extra time, and oftentimes black students don't know that. Or they feel like if I go ask you for extra time, you're gonna think I'm less serious. But yet, most of the students, and it's actually their white peers who say, oh, you can get extra time, go ask professor so-and-so. So the professor, we ought to say, I've had three of you come to me this week for extra time. Let's talk about extra time. Does everybody need extra time? Guess who's gonna say they need extra time? Everybody. And so some of the ways in which we, and that's a small example, but my point is, we have to start looking for ways in which we're distributing and understanding those interactions of time are critical. So I'm gonna close with my third theme. And my third theme's a little bit different. It's not a, um, I'm gonna give you the theme, and then I'm gonna um, introduce it in a certain way. So my third theme is that I think that we have to help students find their unique pattern in life. That is important for us in the work that we do is to really help them find their unique pattern. In my work, I talk about it as how they cultivate who they are inside their soul. Like it's not about their major and them finishing your program or, or your job. It's bigger than that. It is that, but it's who do we want them to become as colleagues in the field? What is the what are the ways in which we want to see them have an impact in their lives and in the field? And so allow me to share a story to set the context for this and to um, take us a little bit on home for questions and answers. So when I was nine years old, my mother began to teach me how to sew. Sewing is a, um, a disciplined thing. You don't just jump up and start sewing. And so, and I enjoyed spending time with my mother, so it was fun to have that time. But when you first learn to sew, it's the fundamentals of sewing. You get a basic pattern. And when you get a basic pattern, there's a picture on the pattern so that you can understand what you're trying to go for. And you usually start with something really simple, like it probably has three pieces, like a front piece, a back piece, and maybe something that connects it. And so you work at that speed and you learn how to seam, line things up, and you feel pretty excited when you get something accomplished. And you look at the front page of that pattern, and you say, oh, wow, my garment is looking like that. And then if you stay with it, because again, it requires discipline, you move on to the next level of pattern. And you add a collar, cuffs, buttonhole, zipper. And when you get to the more complicated patterns, again, you have this picture. But what ends up happening sometimes, you say, my, my garment isn't looking like that. It's not quite. I need to. And then you realize, actually, this pattern, these directions aren't totally working for me. I need to kind of let it out a little bit more in the hips or lengthen it or my sleeves. And you begin to look at the pattern and you say, this isn't quite exactly fitting me and my type, so I need to modify it. And after a while, if you stay with sewing, you develop a sense of confidence about how to work a pattern. And one day when you get confident enough, you say, I'm gonna try some without a pattern. I'm not gonna use a pattern, I'm just gonna be creative. I'm gonna just try to make my own thing. I'm gonna do something that's unique and distinct. I have learned, and I've come to appreciate over the years, that our careers are a lot like sewing. When we start off, in the early parts of my life, I know when I started, I used a pattern. I patterned myself after the adults in my life. So it was my family, it was my parents. And then as I went to college and grad school, I met colleagues and many professors in the field, past recipients of this award, who are like major um, Jim Banks. I studied Jim Banks' work and his persona 20-something um, years ago. And you, you see the patterns of so many colleagues and say, wow, that's unique and distinct. But then you get to a point where you say, but that's not me, and I gotta figure out my pattern. My pattern's a little bit different. I'm taking a little piece here or there, but in order for me to deliver and do what I wanna do in the field, in my work, I've gotta stay unique to my pattern. I think our students, I see our students are as being, that they're on the same path. They're on the same path. When they come to us, they're watching the patterns in the academy. They're watching what's happening in their engagement with us, with each other. They're picking up, they're looking at ways in which they're seeing what works, what doesn't work. 
And they're developing a sense, not just in the academy, but outside the academy, of the patterns that seem to work for them. I think our job, as we are working with students, is to help them really understand what undergirds their desires, their work in the field, and to really, if we decide to work with them from a standpoint of not just teaching them about the fields that we're in and what is important in that field, that's critical to do, but to actually step back and say, if we support them in the ways that they're showing up, particularly for black students, and we don't have to, they're not looking for us to agree with them on everything. They're looking for respect in the process of understanding this is what they're balancing in their lives. And so if we provide them with the resources, both fiscal, human resources, if we provide them with the support, if we affirm who they are and how they show up, I guarantee you, we not only refine the process of their success, we begin to transform what it means for them to think about success in their lives. And each of us can play that kind of role in which we're not at taking away, but we're adding on to the opportunity for them to um, take some of the lessons that we're willing to share with them. What I hope as we um, turn to the uh, space and time, and we're a nice small intimate group for questions and answers, is, or questions that you might have, is that this opened up in my list of some things, some ideas and thoughts from your mind, but as I said to you, they wouldn't necessarily be new, but they're areas that ought to feel familiar. And I'm, I can tell by your nodding that they're familiar areas. So thank you for taking a Friday. I am impressed with you that you showed up. I, I appreciate you in San Diego, beautiful city that you would come spend that time with us here. And so um, thank you again for just the support and, and for being here. So I think I'm transitioning it back to my colleague to um, handle question. Thank you so much for being here. Dr. Fries Britt, thank you for a very informative, um, very, um, at least for me, I would say very touching. Your, your lecture resonated with me as a former college dropout, mil Army veteran, and finding their way to the professoriate. Many of your tones, many of your themes resonated with me, and particularly from how we socialize students. Uh, to, become, to come to the academy as well as progress marked by a sense of community, which um, I think we tend to really not understand how much that gets us through this process. Um, and then the uh, last piece about the authentic spaces. And I would say one of the big, big key takeaways uh, for me in hearing your lecture, um, and you didn't touch on this explicitly, but possibilities. What are the possibilities? And so really thinking about the possibilities when you put all these pieces together, the possibilities are boundless. Uh, so with that, we do have some time for questions. And so I'm just going to open it up to members of the audience. Um, if you can just kind of raise your hand, kind of project your voice, and I'll try my best to then summarize, if not repeat the question and then uh, our distinguished lecturer can go ahead and answer them. I guess coming, showing up is one thing, but asking some questions <laughs> on a Friday, like, you know, you are asking a little too much right now. But we're, we're a great size group, so anything is, and uh, I'm happy to start an answer, but there are some brilliant minds in the room if others want to chime in too, so. You look like you might have a question. Do you have a question? Oh, she's doing her eyebrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, great question. What, that was one of the spaces where I said this one I'll go fast because it's a it's an obvious. But here's I do have an answer. So I think um, the one thing that comes to my mind uh, right now a lot is fundraising efforts to increase resources, um, a lot of private resources I know colleges and universities are doing, but also I think I would be around the table with people at our universities who do a lot of the work around our financial packaging and there are people who that's their expertise, it's not mine, and better understanding what are we, and I know our folks are doing that, people are doing that, but I think a lot of it has to come from additional funding and we have to be very intentional about that. 
and I think a lot of our advancement work and saying there are people out there who want to sponsor and support and if they understand what the needs are in various ways. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I think it has to, and I, and I do think redirecting some of the resources even within a university, and people have done that. Here's where we're gonna put our money. Here's what we're raising money for. Here's what we're identifying. But I, I, there are, I'm sure there are other folks who have a, a whole, who do this work, who can give us a lot more answers. And I don't know if there's anyone in the room who does. But the point is that we've identified it, and actually there's been progress, progress being made by some campuses and, and organizations in this regard. Um, and there are organizations that are thinking about these issues systemically and how to help higher, partnering with higher education for resources to actually um, help with scholarships and more funding. So in this larger effort to um, deal with equity issues, there are foundations and organizations and partners who are figuring out how do they work to raise more of these kinds of opportunity structures to help defray the cost or to pay for schooling. I don't know if anyone who does this work in the audience, or if anyone, okay. So I don't know if you heard um, Dr. Burt's question, but the, le okay, thank you for nodding in the back, uh, my dean back there, um, Dr. Stapleton. Um, so his question was, um, often in the academy, we wanna know what's your next best thing, what's your next project, and it seems like I've talked about my work over the span, and how did I think about that, and how did I, um, so it's a great question, and part of it, I'm gonna be very honest and very transparent. Um, coming as an administrator, I was a senior level administrator, I had no intentions of going into the professoriate. As I said, my professor uh, advisor was, was actually studying alternative pathways and when I was doing my dissertation he said, you would be a great academic. I was like, oh, you would be crazy. Like, like, I was like, that would not be happening. Um, well, uh, it happened. But it was the best thing, it was the best decision. So part of my answer to you is I came out of administration having spent significant time with students in my office who were black about their experiences navigating. And I knew that they were not academically lacking. Right. And so I came into the academic side unexpectedly, but I came in with a sense of what I wanted to do and it was not a pathway that was advised, but I was grown and I said, I can't do this. I gotta do this in a way that I can enjoy doing it. So part of it was risk taking. And I paid a price partially for that, but I saw a longer vision, which was I wanted to be able to cultivate, I really wanted to feel like I had a grasp of a, a database of voices of black high achieving students, well enough saturated enough in my head, and it's over 500 through small focus group and individual interviews. That may not sound like a large number for those of you who use large databases, but for me it's, it's, it's a big number. And when you stay with an organization like NSBP for years, so um, the depth of the work, the value of what I got out of it allowed me to speak um, with more confidence in my team about what we were seeing. And, and here's, here's why that um, was critical. When, we were, when I was invited to serve with AIP on this national task force, ironically, American Institutes of Physics was one of the organizations that um, Let's just say we had to work on seeing the value of my work for a while. But that value was huge in, the, in 2018 because black students were the only students who were not succeeding in physics. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't understand why. Everybody else was doing well. And um, I had been hearing that narrative for years of why they were choosing to leave. So I stayed with it because I saw the value and as a qualitative researcher doing um, that kind of work, you have to, to me, go more deeper into it in sustained way. I, it took a while to build the confidence of that, but it's paid off for me personally handsomely. I didn't, and you have to give up 
sometimes um, the shinier things that look like rewards. So it's, it's, a, it's not an easy path, but I think being more mature when I came in mm -hmm. and having a sense of who I was, was worth that for me. Yes. Of, of the work they're doing or of this work? Of, so. Of, 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 you know, equity in, in okay. of centering black women. Got you. So the question was um, uh, if I could share ways that I've worked with doctoral students, early career folks um, in their process of valuing this kind of work and centering um, this kind of work. Um, when you first asked the question of how I work with doctoral students, I. I really try to get to know them really uniquely individually. I spend an enormous amount of time in that a space of trying to just, and, and not right away, but over time. And, um, and because black students are unique individual people who happen to share blackness as one of many things. They're not all the same, as we all know. And so I've had a wide range of experiences but uh, of how to map that on. What I try to do, and I may not always be successful at it, is um, to try to help them understand and connect with their, I do a better job than probably I did for myself initially, of connections of people in the field to help undergird and support them in the work they're doing. So working in teams helps. So I do a lot of, I have a lot of team, we have a, a Gates team right now of um, eight of our doc students, almost all black students on the, in, in the team. So trying to get in a team sense where they can collaborate and go through and so you have that partnership but also connecting with other faculty outside of Maryland and, and, and encouraging them to go see those folks. And then also realizing that um, it isn't, if you do this kind of work, it may, not, it may not be the kind of work that you get the same gratification, like you're not, you may not get the same recognition initially. So part of it is why do you want to do, why are you doing the work? Understanding why you're doing the work. What's the nature of the work that you're doing? And to again, have a little bit of that long vision but I probably do a better job of also um, helping them access some of the um, quicker wins. So getting it, because you need that to survive mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. and, and when you ask the question something, and I don't know that this is going to answer, but I feel compelled to kind of say this. I am feeling like we need to talk more about what's really great about this work. Like, um, so there's a lot of positives that come out of getting through tenure and getting your work out. It just takes a while to get there sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. Some people get there really quick. Um, I won't drop names, but they got there a lot quicker. You know, they're great. They're just <laughs> fabulous folks. Mm -hmm. um, but there are such incredible rewards, and so what I say to my doc students, and they go, yeah, well, it doesn't look like to me. It look like if you have to wait, it's a time. It's like, you had to wait 15 years for that? You know, and then, right. you know, I'm like, okay, I know that felt long, but, and I'll say to them, it's more than the 15 years, and no, you don't get a big, but it's uh, the impact when you start. So. We just have authentic, real conversations about it. And I do support them when they decide that whatever they want to go, wherever they want to go with their work, that's what I think is most important. I don't know if that answered it for you. I know we're, 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 good. we're almost at time, but actually I want to ask a question um, selfishly. So you've kind of touched on this, but um, I wonder if you can discuss for me like the role faith plays, not religion, oh, yeah. but faith in the fact that you're willing to commit a career to an idea, pursuing an idea that, as you said, may not in the short term yield fruits, but if you stick with it or you know your decision to take that risk and move from administration to the professoriate, and just if you can kind of. Yes, um, so thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. He's getting all deep as we're trying to wrap up at <laughs> 8 o'clock. He's like, can you tell me about faith? And how you go deep? He's going to go, okay, we, do, we have a little private dinner session. So um, it plays an enormous role for me. 
Um, but it's been a, I wrote an article um, 2018, I mean 20, when did I write that article, Retaining Each Other? Um, I was very transparent. My advisor, when did we write Retaining Each Other? 205, 2005 maybe, Bridget Turner, Kelly and I. Um, it was my cathartic article of surviving that first leg of tenure. Mm -hmm. And my advisor called me from Harvard. He said, um, somebody at Harvard read it. He said, I read your article. You were pretty transparent. I said, well, what else am I going to be? You know, I got I to find my soul up in here. You know, I really know I'm serious. And so faith plays a huge role for me. Um, when I was, my same advisor who said, you ought to become an academic, I was like, you need to get a life. And we went through this whole thing. I literally spent time in my home in the living room saying, Lord, are you really asking me to do this? And I, come on, you really can't be, I used to talk about the faculty on my campus so bad. I mean, these are good friends. I would say, y'all are crazy. Now I know why they were crazy, because I'm crazy probably doing some of the same stuff. But I didn't understand the culture of it. I better understand it. I would do it all again. I would do it all again because I think I'm a better professor for having been an administrator, and if I ever went back to administration, I'd be a better administrator from being a professor. And I actually think, um, you know, the journey, so faith plays a crit, played a critical role. Actually, <laughs> Dr. Stanton, we had plenty of meetings when you were postdoc in my office talking about that and having these deep conversations, um, and I've had it with many folks, and so it has, it has um, allowed me to stay authentic mm -hmm. to myself and free. It is nothing better than being free because you were willing to address the difficulties along the path and be okay about saying, if I don't get tenure, right. mm -hmm. that is not a denial of my capacity and capability. Mm -hmm. It is Maryland's loss, right. not mine. Right. But you have to think and understand that you belong. And I used to, I say to my doc students, they could weave this, I say to my doc students, Understand that the university may not be big enough to hold you. Mm -hmm. So don't feel constrained by what UMD, or in any university. Mm -hmm. My university can hold everybody. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> um, No, but truthfully, the academy may not be big enough to hold what you're offering right now. And that is okay. Mm -hmm. And faith allows you to know that, that's, that there's a stage that's bigger than even our universities. And it makes the university easier to be at. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So on that note, please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Uh, Sharon Fries Britt for an amazing, wonderful lecture. And please, we ask now that you join us for the Joint Social Justice Combined Reception in the uh, Grand Ballroom 8 and 9, uh, which starts now till 10 p.m. Thank you.